Welcome, glad you could make it on a Tuesday evening. Hello. Let me know when you're talking to me, Mark. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with CAGT. While we're letting this room fill up with some guests, we are going to uh, just throw a few announcements out to you. It, you can visit coloradogifted.org for the, for the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. On February the 18th will be Legislative Day. Our uh, directors of Legislative Day, Natalie Brown and Paula McGuire have put together a wonderful virtual event. And if you have a high school student they can register for Legislative Day on our website. Also a reminder that you can still access the Colorado Gifted Conference from this fall and the recordings, all of them are there. You can attend all of the breakout sessions. You can attend the keynote sessions. They're all online and visiting, again, visiting coloradogifted.org. And uh, as the president elect of a nonprofit, I would be uh, out of character if I was not mentioning that if you scroll down on coloradogifted.org, you can run into a donate button. So tis the season for giving. <laughs> the next two weeks, we will not be hosting a conversation with CAGT. Uh, we'll be off for winter break. We hope you have a wonderful break. And when we return on January 5th, we'll have Judy Galbraith, decades of common and not so common comments and questions from gifted kids. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Hess, I'm the president-elect for Colorado Gifted, and I am pleased to host tonight, Addressing the Elephant, Missing and Unmotivated Gifted Children, a conversation with Dr. Gilman W. Whiting on historical and contemporary beliefs, policies, and practices that lead to inequality in gifted programs and services. Dr. Whiting is the Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of African, and diaspora studies at Vanderbilt University. His research includes educational disparity, special and gifted education. Dr. Whiting has authored, authored over 70 scholarly publications, created the scholarly identity model and directs the Achievement Gap Institute. He consults with school districts nationally and internationally. Uh, Dr. Whiting, we are so proud and happy to be able to host you tonight in our end of the year conversations with CAGT. Thank you, thank you. Are we live now? Am I on this thing? <laughs> we are live and I'm just okay. about to hit the record button. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Let me know when you want me to go. We're ready to roll. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well tonight in these crazy times. I'd be remiss if I didn't start off by uh, starting us off with the land acknowledgement. I wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to the regions, recognize that Vanderbilt here in Nashville sit on as well as Colorado's and the universities are built on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Arapaho, Arapaho, uh, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples, Potawatomi, Shawnee, Miami, and Delaware peoples, all visitors to these lands 
I would like to pay my respect to the elders and descendants who have stewarded these lands and waters since the beginning. So welcome, and I love uh, being here to share a little bit of conversation with you today. Yesterday, as I was riding back from an appointment, I saw a food line, a, an actual food line, and, and I'm coming to find out that there are more of these popping up around the country than we even know. So many men were there that I didn't know what was going on as I passed by and I circled the block and there was a table lined up with people there to eat in the afternoon. Good thing it was a warm day here in Nashville. But I'm thinking about where we are as a nation. And I think about where these men came from. I started thinking about their lives. I started thinking about how they ended up in the situation that they're in. I know mental health is a major issue. Uh, but I imagine that when I look at these men out here, and women, by the way, I start to think what happened in life that put them in that place? What happened in their lives put them in that situation? So when I talk about gifted children, I talk about people to what we see today. I'm going to share a little piece of what I'm working with with a group in Maryland's gifted program. Uh, and I was just recording today. And for those of you who have family members who are ill right now, or friends who are ill right now, I want to send my thoughts and prayers out to them as well. I have several family members who uh, actually are either on their deathbed, who have died, and friends at the same time who have been struck by this COVID-19 virus that we're dealing with. So I want to send that out to you first, especially in the season of, thanks, of Christmas time. I also want to uh, let you know that I'm going to share some of the footage that I shot for them with you because I go into a personal narrative that you'll see. And I think it's very appropriate as we talk about the elephant in the room. And for me, the elephant in the room are always the children. It's always what I'm here for. Uh, no matter who you're for or who you're against, if you're for the children and I'm on your team. So I want to share that with you. Uh, before I go there, um, I'm going to make a, a switch over in the screen. So hold on one quick second. I'm going to switch to a whole new screen. Mark, if you have any questions or, uh, or let me know if the sound is not high enough and I'll, and I'll make adjustments.
I think it's gonna be all right if everybody come and stop being scared because shoot, I don't think there's nothing to be scared of. Then just got used to self behind and it's hard to adjust when I was school. How do you think things are gonna work out here at Roxbury High? Huh? Oh, I guess it'll work out all right. If the parents to stay out of it all, let the kids work it out for themselves, it'll be all right. How does a how does a kid feel going to school? Whatever their status is, whether they're gifted or general education, special education, it doesn't matter. How do you feel going to school and being thought of as the problem? I watched the tears and pain and fear of the little kids in the video we just watched. And it takes me back to a time when I went to school. I stop here in terms of a little bit of an autobiographical narrative because uh, I went to high school in Boston. I was a freshman three years after busing started in Boston, Massachusetts. I got to Boston, Massachusetts the year before the blizzard of 1978. And and just three days before my birthday, while walking home from a convenience store that was just 200 meters from my house, it was a sunny Saturday afternoon. Three young boys walked across the street with a, they were wearing, two of them were wearing football uniforms and one wasn't wearing a uniform. And there was a fourth person behind him. I didn't see him at the time. And he was carrying, as they walked towards me, he was carrying one of the small guy's helmets in his hand. And as they passed by me, I gave him a, you know, a head shrug of what's up as they passed by on both sides of me. And I continued to walk with whatever I had in my hand. And then the next thing I saw was like the blur of, of the street it looked like it became two or three streets. And it, it was sound went away and it was distorted. So shook my head, didn't know what it was. I turned around and what happened was one of the kids, the bigger kids had swung the helmet and hit me in the back of my head. I reached up and felt it and I looked at my hand and there was blood running down the side of my neck. I had a white t-shirt on. Afro. I can remember what I was wearing to this date. And I always like to make the joke that that's when my track and field career began because I did a 180 and bolted. I ran so fast that I ran right past my house. As I passed my house, there was a hill. The house sat on a, on a hill. It was an apartment complex. In the front, it had two floors or three floors in the back it had five so it was built on a hill and as i passed the house i made a sharp left to go downstairs and go around to the back but they had rows and rows of hedges that were used for runoff and things like that i assume as i got to the bottom i remember running down through the trees and it hit me in the face so i put my arm up to block my face and i got down the bottom and i realized that i just ran through what probably was 50 yards of rose bushes. So now, as you can imagine, my arm was a bloody mess. My shirt was covered. And I was down the bottom of the hill now, but the adrenaline was pumping through my body. As I looked back up the hill at the boys who were yelling explicitives down at me, I got tough and started yelling back up at them. But as I walked around the corner to enter the back of my house, I withered. I broke down. I, I was gone. I went in the back door, came to the house. I couldn't even open the door. I didn't know where my keys were. I knocked on the door. My father opened the door. I was on my knees. He picked me up like a wet sack and he was furious. I could see it in his eyes. What happened? Somebody hit me, so I got jumped. I didn't know what happened. We're gonna hit once, twice, five, I didn't know. He picked me up like a kitty by the neck and took me downstairs into the car, rode around with a gun on the front seat looking for these boys. To them, glad he didn't find them because I knew what he would have done if he had. Of course, as we got back and he's looking around asking people, some woman in the window saw this, some woman in the window saw that. But for me, I was afraid from that day forward to go to school. I lived in West Roxbury, which is a city, just a couple of cities removed from Roxbury, where most of black folks lived at the time. My father at that time was working on his doctoral degree at, uh, in something, uh, psychology or something, and um, working at a university. So 
he lived, we lived in a suburb of Boston. But I went to West Roxbury High School, which was in an all white neighborhood. For the next couple of years until I started learning to understand what racial differences were, I would take the city bus that came right by my house. I would take it two or three stops to a neighborhood that was mixed with black and Hispanic students, wait for that school bus, get on that school bus and go right, right back by my house past my bus stop to go to school. I didn't let my father know that for years. Now I mention this because I can recall times and incidences in Boston when riding home from school at night during swim practice, I'm a swimmer as well, having a towel on my head because it's so cold, laying my head against the window, falling asleep, only to have my head, head fall out of the window out like that out of the window, not realizing that somebody had just thrown a brick, right? Broke the wind. So you're constantly, constantly worried about what would happen next. Just a few days after I started school, one week after my getting jumped, less than two weeks after arriving, uh, there was a group of students who were visiting Boston. I believe they were coming from uh, Pittsburgh, somewhere in Pennsylvania. And there were several teenagers, young, like 15 to 18 year olds. And they, and the teacher was about 25. They were jumped at the Bunker Hill Monument. I'm not gonna go into tell you what the Bunker Hill Monument was and what it was for. You can look that up yourself. But they were jumped with baseball bats and chains. My father heard of this, of course, and then he went out again, him and some of his friends were headed down there to where the Bunker Hill Monument was located. The article that you'll see, a little clip, is just from the newspaper from that day. It's actually from the New York Times archives that documented the, the, the jump, the jumping of the kids that happened, I believe it was in um, Charleston, I think the monuments in Charleston. Anyway, as I progressed through school, I found myself who I know was highly talented and gifted in so many ways, I find myself more aligning myself with folks who looked like, believed like I did. I abandoned what one would call educational grit for fitting in to a group, into the crowd. So I think about the words that we're focusing on today as in the last session. The first session, by the way, was dealing with awareness, excuse me, assessment, assessment coming into knowledge of what we're doing in terms of data and those things like that. The thing about assessing and students learning, but also think about assessing historical facts of how we got where we are. Then we had to deal with the whole issue today, not only with assessment, but now we're also going to look at issues around acknowledgement or acknowledging. Can we, in fact, acknowledge what we've learned? There's, a, I believe there's an internal and an external acknowledgement that goes along. The external acknowledgement is, yes, I see it. I know it happened, historically accurate and those things. Internal acknowledgement is the acknowledgement that has some sort of feeling to it. It's a connection to that 13, 14 year old kid who was just jumped by four guys and hit in the head with a football helmet. It is the feeling of pain and anger, sending your child on a field trip from another state only to be jumped by adults with baseball bats and chains. It's not the acknowledgement of yes, George Floyd was murdered in front of us. It's the feeling that goes along with it. That feeling that tends to be very easily looked over for several reasons. And for us to think about the first two steps, again, the assessment, I should understand these things. The awareness, Hi, now I understand it. Message. Now I'm aware of it's happening. Now, how do I acknowledge that? How do I actually 
move towards becoming responsible. That acknowledgement for this session deals with how we move from being teacher, program coordinator, principal, or parent to advocate. How do we personally, internally acknowledge that these things are happening? And then how do we acknowledge them openly? How do we, if we see something wrong, we say something about it? How do we do those things? This is not just a kid getting jumped. These can be things such as I've mentioned several times, policies that are in our schools. The issue that came up in our last live dealt with, uh, one of the questions came up, dealt with the new data that are out through the OCR. Normally what will happen with the new data, when, when those new data come out, by the way, what we need to do with those is that, that we have to have the information out there, but also that folks who are actually within those areas, in those states, are going to look at their data more specifically. And it will take a while for the all of the data to be looked at. What I would suggest is get that Jerry report that I put up last week. I put it again this week as well. The Jerry report, pull that up from the Purdue.edu site, and then look at uh, schools that identify compared to schools that don't identify. You have to compare like schools. You have to compare state RIs. And once you look at the report and read it, you understand what the RI stands for. That's R as Romeo, I as in intelligence. And we have to think about uh, how the access question and the RIs look within schools. So we're comparing apples and apples and not apples and dump trucks. When we, that's assessment by the way. And once we accept, uh, assess those differences or the changes over time, then we can look at whether or not the changes have shown progress or they're an anomaly. And we don't know that yet. It's too soon to tell. The data has to be, takes a few months actually to, to get into it. And then also to get into someone's specific school. But once we have it, we have awareness of it. We acknowledge that something is wrong, something's right. Now we move into our responsibility, which is gonna be next session to accountability. So if you're not getting it just yet, it's assessment, awareness, accountability. How do we do that? When I went to, went from Rhode Island as a little kid to go to junior high school in Southern Florida, once tested, I was moved up two grade levels. Regional, I don't know. It, I was just moved two grade levels. When I got back to Boston, I was moved back one grade level. So I still ended up one grade level ahead. I often think about some of the things, this is gonna seem off topic a little bit, but it also has to do with acknowledgement. And when we get to the final pieces and I start talking about scholar identity, you'll get to understand this. There's things that me coming from the Northeast, me being very light skin, me having hair that is not typically coarse or short, me being leaner and taller, had privileges to it moving from the north to the south. There's no doubt in my mind. I remember them, I felt them. When I came back to Boston, I looked like all the other kids who were there, whether they were Cape Verdean or Puerto Rican or black or white, or whatever. I looked like I fit in and there was enough people look like me that it wasn't a, an anomaly. These things happen as well. Acknowledgement for me, when it comes to race, culture, interracial culture, has to do with me being, uh, being able to acknowledge myself and affirming what happened in my life 
So as I go through these things and as I talk about these things with us, we need to think about the, the distance between uh, folks who come from the same racial groups. So as we move forward uh, in this training today or in this conversation today, I want you to think about <clears throat> what you've heard in terms of history, not just that's new or whatever, but that how much we don't know from history. We also talked about now that we know it, we're now aware of it, right? What do we do with that? Do we discard that information? Do we seek out more information, new knowledge? And then once we get past that phase into acknowledgement, we acknowledge it on two levels, like I said, externally and internally. I know a lot of people acknowledge right out front of folks that said, yes, racism is bad. Yes, those kids over here don't have this. We saw the data I put up earlier is there's $23 billion are spent more on white kids than others. What does that mean inside of you? Acknowledging disparity with regards to educational outcome. What does that mean inside of you? That is where we are today. If we do not acknowledge, if we do not take full accountability, and without accountability yet, that's next. If we do not acknowledge what is happening today, then kids will continue to get jumped in the street. Students will continue to be left out of gifted programs, even though they're well qualified to be in programs. And we'll continue this rift. So back to being intentional. Once we have these things, we as scholars and educators and parents and whatever your role is, it's our duty and responsibility to, again, read more, learn more, see more, say more, do more with regards to acknowledging and affirming culture and gifted education. Okay. So welcome back. I just wanted to share something before I get going. And uh, from that report that I had up from uh, Purdue, the Jerry report, this is a small snippet of one of the pages that are in there. And each state from Arizona all the way down uh, has a report card in it. And this will be shown uh, in there. It's free to download. I encourage all of you to go take a look at it. I think it's something that will definitely help you understand better. And it talks about access, equity, what we call missingness, and also a summary for each state. So definitely pull this down. The uh, email is right there. Uh, you can go back and watch this and clip it if you haven't seen it already. Um, but if you want it, I'll put it up later on. If it comes up in the Q&A, we'll throw it up inside of there. So I just wanted to share that all with you uh, because I felt there was so much appropriate there. A lot of times when we have these conversations, we get into people, and rightfully so, we get into people dealing with the data. We're, we're data-driven so much so that we, we get inundated with it. But ultimately, people make policies. And I know these policies oftentimes are driven by data, but it's a dog chasing its tail sometimes because teachers in the classrooms, parents at home, they can see these things and they need to say something about these things. We have to have this collaboration between schools, communities, homes, as well as uh, uh, mentoring and, and all those other kind of areas that help support our children. I was just working with a, a school district. I'll leave the, uh, the, the school district out of it, but we're looking at some of the, uh, the new data are coming out for the school district for gifted. Now that they're in this hybrid mode, one school in a cluster of 26 schools, a school district that serves 38,000 students in a K-12, about 15,500 of those are elementary school kids. Of that, uh, they take two tests. They take the COGAT and what they call the, uh, the MAP data at the second grade for the third grade. And uh, there's no assessment, there's no teacher assessment, there's no building, there's, there's nothing other than that. And it's actually from compared to national norms. So of that 15,000 uh, children, <clears throat> they came up with 35 uh, in the program that would be moving into gifted services. 
of that, there was one who identified as having two or more races. There were two Asian students, two African-American students, two uh, Hispanic or Latino students, and the rest were white students in this school district. So we have to think about what's happening in terms of the measurement that goes on because talking to one of the principals, she said, I know I have students here who are way above this in terms of the school. And she's looking at 500 kids so she can see these things and teachers have told her these things, but yet they're still not happening for the students. So for me, I think sometimes we need to step back and take a look and assess what culture looks like. What does that look like? When we talk about, when I always talk about this elephant in the room, elephant in the room for me is like the thing that people don't want to discuss. It's the uncomfortable thing that people don't want to discuss. And I just say, well, it's a child. And no matter how we look at it, no matter how you approach it, it's something that has to be understood, something that has to be dealt with, something that has to be approached. So I don't know where we are in time here. Uh, we're at 6.30 now, uh, 6.30 here in Nashville, 5, 5 30 there. But I see um, where our Q&A at all, uh, because I can keep going, but I want to make sure that I have time to actually interact with the folks who are actually taking the time to be online. So let me know how it's going and what, what's the next step we want to take here. Okay, uh, Dr. Whiting, I think it's so uh, it's 530 and maybe go uh, about another 10 minutes mm -hmm. or so and we'll open some q and I can do that, no problem. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. So we're dealing with a time now where students and schools and adults now, because of this coronavirus deal, because of the political deal we're in, as well as the protests over the summer, people are starting to look at things they never saw before. We all know this word woke now uh, with, with Instagram and all these other kind of social media moments we have, people are now becoming woke, which means they're becoming more aware of things that are happening because their children are now getting involved in bringing things home. I had the fortunate opportunity to go up to, um, um, was it Mon no, Montana, but, uh, uh, Minneapolis, yes, Minneapolis, another one of those M's. Minneapolis and go to the George Floyd Memorial and see what was there. And I saw kids, I, I kid you not, I saw kids that were young as five or six years old and I saw people old as 90 years old. I saw people from outside the United States and all over the city as well as the country. I was there the day, the day I left, a young man walked from Alabama all the way to the George Floyd Memorial, walked there the whole, whole time. So this was a, a earth shaking. What I don't want to happen, what I think needs to happen is how do we maintain that? I'm old enough and a lot of us on here old enough to remember Rodney King. We remember the riots of the early nineties and things like that. Some of us may even be old enough to know the riots of the 1960s and seventies. I don't know those, I was a little kid then, but I'm sure there are folks who remember those. And we know those moments pass. How do we hold on to what we have now? How do we hold on to the energy that we, we are seeing? How do we do that? That's something that comes from inside. Now, when I had that little piece that I was talking there, I went into it and the reason why I really put that there was because I wanted us to think about our own emotional involvement because I know that if we talked about something or someone hurting someone we loved, a child, a mother, a father, a loved one, whoever they may be, we would get very passionate about it. Why is it that we can look at, and this report shows, the report that shows called Access Denied, Access Denied, why would we look at and know that we possibly are missing up to 3 million, say that again, 3 million children who are Native American, Pacific Islander, African American or Black, Latino, Hispanic, low income, and all across different areas from city to urban, to suburban, to rural, to small towns, reservations. We're missing students in our, from our gifted education. If we were to take 3 million people, from, if somebody from another country were to come and take 3 million of our best, brightest people from this country, we'd, st we'd go to war for it. But yet we're missing that every day. We're missing that every day from our children. This COVID-19 timeframe has created a rift, a gigantic rift in terms of children who were already behind last year, 
because substandard schools, uh, unprepared teachers, teachers who didn't come out of school with, let's face it, they, you're not required to take classes on cultural uh, issues, unless you're looking at it from a deficit pers uh, perspective. For example, you look at high instance poverty. So you're looking at kids who are living in low income areas and projects and those things like that. And that becomes your frame of reference for the children in your classroom. No matter where they come from, what their backgrounds are, that's what the new teacher can see. Just like having a, a very good teacher for two or three years in a row, having a very poor teacher for two or three years in a row can be detrimental to the rest of your life. I look at the spectrum from pre-K through PhD. And working at Vanderbilt University, I can see students who graduate. But I also know that across the country, on average, the African-American male is actually graduating at about 42 to 48%, depending on what school you look at. So if you were to take 100 folks, 100 young black men or brown men at birth, 18 years later, half of them would go on to uh, graduate from high school, first off. And then from there, only half of them should go on to four years later to six years later, less than half of them will graduate. And if you didn't do the numbers, you're down to about 8%. And we know in this society, what are you going to do with just a bachelor's degree? Unless you're in nursing or education, and those are not fields that black, brown men are jumping to go into, unless you have somebody great, like I love to put this up real quick, unless you have somebody great like you have in Colorado with Mar uh, Margarita Bianco and her program uh, to teaching, this is, these, are, these are really interesting things where you have an educator right there in the state who is actually trying to find ways, give pathways, if you will, for students to go into teaching. That is very important because I do know that other teachers need to see other scholars and how they communicate and act with children, right? There's a lot of resources that you can put up there. You have the Hope rate, uh, Teacher Rating Scale. This is some work that I love this because of uh, Dr. Gentry and, and others who put this work together. Actually, the proceeds that go to us go right to a summer camp for gifted children. So these are some of the things we can actually get as resources to use, to work with. So for me, there are a lot of times and a lot of information that is out there, that are out there that can help us bridge the gap, bridge the gap. This summer, I worked with several hundred kids who otherwise would continue to slide. That's why I left off. We have students who are in already failing, poor, low performing schools who normally will fall back during the summer. Now they've already had a whole rest of the year from March on where they were hybrid or, or home or public schools shut down early, they were gone. Private schools, they kind of figured out how to make it work. My daughter went to one, they went all the way up to graduation. They made it work. Those kids lost out. When they got home, technology was not there. The gap grows. Each one of these things equal up to what Dr. Latz and Billings called it educational debt. We are right now in the middle of one of those things, an educational debt. And for us not to recognize that during this time when I started off by saying I have people on food lines and I have people who are in hospitals, these children right now are setting the path that will do like I did. Either they're gonna drop out by the time they get to junior high school or high school or they're gonna to stick to it. Now, it is time for us to stop giving lip service to it and start hiding behind numbers and data. We know what's happening. We can see what's happening and understand funding formulas and all that kind of stuff. But all of these officials are elected positions. And we have to make sure that people who are in these positions actually care about the children that they're serving and not about getting elected again for the position that they're doing poorly in the first place. I wanna give a gigantic shout out to some of the teachers that are up in uh, Minneapolis. They've got a teacher network up there they're called in Good Trouble Principles. Two or 300 of them are getting together on issues around inequities inside of the, uh, the school districts in that state. And I think that's something, a model that can be replicated all over the country. And reason why I'm not specifically talking about gifted children right now, because in my work with scholar identity, I found many students who were like me, 
high achieving, underperforming students who would rather be hanging out with their friends than going into a place where they felt like they weren't wanted. I know a lot of my colleagues who actually were highly gifted going through a school who they themselves felt outcast. How do we not only deal with recruitment, how do we deal with and diversity? How do we deal with uh, retention and inclusion? How do we deal with equity? We right now are as divided as we were in before Brown versus Board of Education. Our school systems right now and the public school systems are almost equally split with regards to almost all black or all white schools. Charter school movements are stripping public schools from monies and we have to figure this thing out because each year that number of 3 million grows. So how do we fix those things? This digital divide that we're dealing with right now is something that we have to do, we have to deal with. We have some children who actually had to take their uh, classes sitting in the parking lot near a store, a convenience store on computers or laptops because they had no Wi-Fi at home. So there are disparate impacts that are happening all around us. We're trying to give the students to toward them because we're missing them. They're there, we just have to reach out to find them. Get the report, check it out. All the information is in there. You can contact Dr. Gentry or myself uh, and, and have conversations. I would love to have this conversation with you because I hate this format. I'm talking to a little circle in front of you I, and, and I wish I could see your faces and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. But this is the situation we're in right now. Hopefully within the next however many months, we'll be back to a point where we can get together and have a chit chat. So I will stop now and I will open up for any kind of questions, queries, ideas, thoughts, and um, yeah, we'll go from there. So thank you very much for your time. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments and I'll, I'll try to monitor that as best I can. Dr. Whiting, I'll start with one. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about lo using local norms for identification for the past year or more. What do we say to the administrator who says, we're not going to use local norms. Look, we've got a 95th percentile. That's that's the state guidelines, and we're going to stick to that. What do we say to that sort of response? Well, again, the the, the data bear out what actually are there. They uh, just like they're using the the standard. That standard was uh, that's a policy. That's one of the policies I talked about. The policy was set by a legislative body. We need to reevaluate. It's kind of the, the constitution and some of these other things, the amendments, the things that are changed. There are states who are using them. There are states who are changing them. But again, when one person, I like to say this all the time, when one person tries to make a change, they call that suicide. When two people try to make a change, this looks like what they call lover's leap. But you get four or five or more uh, 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 individuals as well as leaders of, um, I, I don't know how you pronounce your thing, CGAT. Um, you get those folks, you get uh, gifted coordinators, you get the schools that are actually dealing with the students to actually come together. That's how you get people to look at it because the experts aren't where they're making the decisions at a lot of times. The experts are actually lower in the food chain, if you will, if, if this were a food chain. So my thing is folks at the top tend to try to find ways to save money and also keep the, the people quiet. Remember this too. I had a conversation with a, a former director of schools superintendent here in Nashville seven year, several years ago, 2008, 2009. I went in with a colleague of mine, Dr. Donna Ford, who was at Vanderbilt at the time, now at The Ohio State University. And we sat together in this room and this superintendent told us that he could get away with almost anything. And he gave us examples, and I won't repeat them because it might be small children watching. He could get away with anything, he said, but if he starts messing with the gifted education, he said he would lose his job that day. He said, because the parents don't want it. So as we start talking about the legislation and all these 95% rules and things like that, what we're really talking about are redlining gifted education. We're talking about the disparate impact that AP has, which is more uh, uh, disparate than is gifted education. We look at public school systems with IB programs that look like private charter schools inside public schools running on public dollars. So that's lip service as far as I'm concerned when it comes down to what the legislation 
has to say. I'm saying that we <laughs> let's get together and go down there. And, and, and I was gonna say something, but it's, I forgot we're recording. Um, let's go down and have a conversation, a chit chat with them and uh, let them know how we really feel and what's really happening for the children in our own communities, in our own states. Um, we know that creating partnerships with communities is really important. And uh, I teach in a large urban district and many of our teachers do not live in the community in which they teach. Hmm. Do you have any recommendations about how to access communities and build partnerships when, especially, you know, when, when you're disconnected from that community you teach in? Yes, I, I do. I, I think about this all the time, uh, believe it or not, because the universities are in those situations. The universities somehow or another, when a lot of researchers get there, they find communities that they can do research in. They'll go there, they'll do research, they'll write their papers, they'll finish their doctoral work, they'll finish their graduate work, they'll, they'll write their articles, they'll get promoted, they'll, and they'll leave. And they kind of rake through and get all the data they can out of these communities and leave them. So when I came here in 2004, and I went over to Edge Hill Projects, which is less than, I could actually, if, if no houses when we throw a stone project. By my gut there, and I went in there and tried to talk to some of the parents. They're like, oh, he's from Vanderbilt. You know, all they want to do is they were, they were over it. But what I did was I had to stick to it. I had to find uh, college students who were at Vanderbilt and create a cadre of them to actually work with the parents and the students and create and foster that relationship. And when you're distant from a space, there are people that bridge that space. It's kind of like when people want to go to soccer, they carpool, they figure that thing out. And that's the same thing that happens here. There are resources and folks who want to do it, who wish they could actually communicate and, and liaison with the folks you're talking about. But there's no central connecting dropping space for us to get together to do those things. I think one of these forums like this right here, a lot of people here and say, hey, let's do that. I recall one time when I was at, um, I was up doing a visiting with uh, Joe Renzulli at his center up there in, uh, in Connecticut. And I went out, he, he brought all these students in from one of his demonstration schools in Hartford. And I talked to these guys and girls for about 45 minutes. It was a great conversation. And I told him, hey, when you finish, if you wanna contact me, here's my email address. This is before cell phones were big and all that stuff there. But here's a, by the time I got back to my room, I had 14 kids who had emailed me. So I started being in communication with these kids and I created what I call a e-motivation program. So it was electronically, now it'd be I motivation, right? But it's e-motivating. I wrote an article on it called e-motivating Malcolm. And I followed this young man uh, through high school into college, into an uh, accident when he played football, into a marriage, into a child and those things there. People want you to stick with them. I know that places like in Miami Dade County and places like that where they have a large Cuban population, they have teachers and administrators who mirror them. And you won't find the same gaps that you find with all of the other Latino populations that are in the United States. And then by the way, I say that when I say Dominican Republic, or I say Puerto Rican, or I say um, uh, 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 Mexican, or I say Q Cuban, they're not the same group of people just because they speak the same language. You know, people here in Tennessee are not the same as the people here in Davidson County, where Vanderbilt is for that matter. So we have these differences, but we can bridge the gap if we actually decide how are we gonna do this? Let's get together and plan a way to carpool this information to those folks who live in those rural spaces. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from uh, our watchers here. What, what are we missing in training our teachers on how to identify children of color? I know that's a big question. Yeah, I, I, can, I can handle some of that. Well, thanks for the question, first off. I love to hear questions because they make me think. And the que I have thought about this question though. And what are we missing? Well, I think when we think about the, the industry, there's a thing called the Griggs Principle. And, and a lot of people talk about um, why would you test somebody on something that they're not going to do, right? And I found that to be a disparate impact on uh, other things. For example, uh, there's a new thing that just came out, not new, uh, it's been out for a while. One of the architects of, the pro of this program was uh, none other than the late great Johnny Cochran, and it became out to be the Rooney Rule. And the Rooney Rule said that for any lead position, 
on football or any other kind of industry that you're going to have to have, you have to at least interview these minority candidates, at least one in these fields. As soon as he did that, as soon as they did that, and it went into the Rooney Rule came out of Pittsburgh with the uh, Rooney there. Uh, when that went into effect, and I'm getting back to your question in a second, when that came into effect, what happened? The very next year, they hired the first uh, African-American coach uh, to Chicago Bears. The next one was they hired the first African-American coach at the, um, the Indianapolis Colts. That next year, those two coaches became the first two African-American coaches in the Super Bowl. And of course, one of them won. That was something that was forced. We can go through, and this is the answer to a question, we can go through a whole undergraduate career, our masters and our PhDs without ever having to be required, there's a word required, to take a class in multicultural education. That is something that students need to ask for. If I have enough students asking for something at my program at Vanderbilt as the Director of Graduate Studies in the program, in the Department of African American and Diaspora Studies, we can actually create that if we want to. That's something we can do. And I think that is something else because the industry with the Griggs principle, as well as the Football League, they they figure that we still have students who are doing pretty much like what they did with a lot of Vietnam uh, uh, officers. And that was that they gave them six, eight, 10 weeks of training and threw them right in the middle of the stuff. So we've got some teachers, we've got some teachers in the field now through Teach for America who weren't even education in their undergraduate degrees. And now they're down in the Mississippi Delta teaching children for three years until they can get themselves together and get their next job. I'm not dumping on Teach for America. I think it's a great idea, conceptually, kind of like no child left behind. It's a great idea, conceptually, but we're not doing that anymore. Why? Because the results, you know, we have to think about, are we just filling it with teachers who just need a job, something to do to rest between college and marriage? Or are we doing something that's going to benefit the kids? I don't want any teacher in any classroom who is afraid of children, who doesn't think that children, uh, they can look at another, a small child and think that that child is six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, and that's all they are. I don't want them looking at them, oh, the poor little baby. That's deficit thinking as well. So a lot of times the books behind me didn't come with me when I was born. I had to go get them and read them. I had to want to do that. That was my long conversation that I had a few minutes ago that said that, I want you to feel that thing. When, when George Floyd, when Ahmaud Arbery or Breonna Taylor died this summer, a part of me felt it, I felt it. A lot of people see it and they say, oh, that's wrong, but you don't feel it. If that were your sister or your brother or your father, you'd feel differently. So if that child in that classroom was actually yours and think about it, these children we're talking about will become adults and they will become productive parts of the society or not. And a lot of it depends on what we do in the classroom. I give all the credit in the world to my high school teachers. I have two in particular and a, a track coach who I know that have not been for them, I would not be where I am. Because one of them pat me on the back and said, I know you can do this, add a boy. And then sometimes that's all it takes. Kids don't care about how much we know intellectually until they know we care about them personally. Can you create a relationship with a child? I think we can, but oftentimes we don't. I think that uh, addresses wonderfully one of the last questions I was gonna ask. and. Uh, which uh, came from one of our watchers is like, what's the first thing that each of us can do to start making a difference? And I think you've just answered that. And um, you were talking about how much we don't know about history. Mm. And one of the things that we don't know about history are individual histories. And when you share your story, for example, what you did today, we relate to that, not just with our minds, but with our hearts. And that's part of building that relationship. And so uh, I'm so thankful and grateful that you shared your story with us today. 
that you sh shared your expertise. Um, once upon a time, I got a chance to see you and Dr. Ford for a whole day. You came to Colorado Springs, and uh, okay. you did a, you did a training for us, and it was a it was a wonderful eye opening day. And thank you so much for sharing a, a piece of that with us on conversations with CAG team. Um, just uh, once again, just thank you. We're very grateful. Well, I I want to I want to say that I. I personally want you all to take um, screenshots. I want you to, I don't get anything from this, by the way, you know, I'm just going to do my little thing. It's not even going to be about me, but I want you to do this because what you all are doing these conversations with CAGT. I think this is truly the way to help teachers and families, administrators and all folks get in there. I think what Nanette and you are doing, I just, I, I think it's, again, like in Minnesota, I think it's a model that all programs need to do. How do we bring these folks who sit in these Ivy Towers, how do we bring them into talking to real people so that a teacher can walk out of this thing and say, well, I have Gil Whiting's uh, e uh, email address. I can just email them if I want to. And that is something that I think we need to be able to, uh, be able to do. Because uh, in terms of... Uh, social media on uh, social media that we're we're running through every day. We're all dealing with different kinds of ways people can contact us, and that's something that we need to actually take advantage of. How do we uh, communicate with people outside of this venue? Sorry, I got some things jumping around in my technology over here, but anyway. So that's what I want. That's what I want to be able to talk to you all about, and that was that. Um, we are no further away than, than picking up a phone. I mean, I know we're all Zoomed out too, by the way. There's nobody here who wants to spend one more minute on a Zoom call. I know that. Neither do I. That's not something we want to do. But I do know it's something that uh, if folks don't know the answer to a question, then that's something that they can actually find out very easily. And I'm gonna stick my uh, uh, email address right here on the screen and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. And there you go. And you can just contact me there. I Really, I might not get back to it tonight. I might take me a day to two to get back to it. But the point is that I you have access to us. I'm, I'm working with several scholars. Uh, we call ourselves sometimes, we call ourselves good trouble scholars. And what that looks like, I don't know what's gonna pop up here, but I hope it's gonna be what I'm looking for. Here we go, good. All right, so this right here is a group of consortium of scholars. There's about 13 of us in this thing who all met several years ago at uh, the NAGC that was held in um, Minneapolis. Uh, and one of the questions came up, it was the 100th year, coming up to the 100th year anniversary of uh, Lewis Terman, uh, eugenicist, uh, as well as the founder of, um, well, what we call them uh, in the IQ, we all know about that, but they also had a place in Stanford they called the farm. And the farm for, was notorious for having, um, uh, look, just, just look up the farm dealing with um, uh, Stanford. I don't wanna waste all our time on that. But these scholars here that I'm, I'm putting up, I'm gonna make the screen just a little bit bigger because I want you to see some of these folks. These folks, we looked at our work and our work actually is probably close to 400 years if you stacked everybody's work on top of one another. You have folks who down in the bottom right hand side there, the bottom four, who PhDs are pretty new in terms of the last couple of years. Up until the top row, upper left, you have folks who've been in the field for 40 plus years. So you'll see some of these folks, and I believe you just had Dr. Joy Davis there not too long ago, right? So these are some of the scholars, a consortium for inclusion, we call ourselves IURGE that formed out of a need. The need was that we have collective experience and ideas and we have uh, our education, K-12 education is not changing. We're not having a, a gigantic jump in terms of who's graduating. As a matter of fact, more white women are graduating every year, every year. So they're gonna keep entering to the field. So they're gonna keep that 80 to 90% being the teachers in the field. And the guys are gonna be very, very small numbers. We know that. 
we can try to do things like Margarita Bianco is doing there and try to bring more scholars into the field, which I think is the one of the greatest ideas I, I can imagine. But at the same time, we also have to prepare the teachers that are with us there. I want to close by sharing something with you because I know that was one of the things. And what I want to share uh, with you, if you don't mind, is basically some uh, work. Uh, this is my, um, I'm trying to figure out which one it is. This is my uh, daughter. Uh, she is um, Havlin uh, Nona Gay Whiting. And she's uh, the 2018 Nashville Youth Poet Laureate. She's the 2018 Southeast Regional Poet Laureate. She's a 2019 US Poet Laureate Ambassador. And she got into um, the Sorbonne in Paris and she was there for a while. Now she's in New York doing classes and she'll be going probably to Tulane or out to um, Ireland to Trinity. She wrote a book, a poetry book that I tell you is, is just knock your socks off. Um, look her up on YouTube. Uh, just go have whiting. I have a page there. And um, listen to some of her poetry. Very heavy uh, for a 15 to 16 year old. But this is the reason why I put this here, and I'm not going to talk about anything I do in terms of writing or anything like that. If somebody wants to follow, if somebody wants to learn more, if somebody wants to get in touch, you can do that. But for a young scholar, a young person to have the work, also a Jenkins scholar. Uh, NAGC uh, 2018 or 2019, she was a Jenkins Scholar, uh, awarded at the NAGC there in Al not Albuquerque, but wherever we were before that. And um, for me, I think it's, oh, it was actually in Minnesota, I believe. Um, for me, I think this is something that, a way we can actually look at these things, look at what kids are doing. Because some of her words, they, again, if I had a little bit more time, I'd put one of her poems on, but I'm not going to bother us with that right now. I just want to let you know I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the folks who were able to, um, to be here tonight, because for me, it's an opportunity to um, share my thoughts. And I'd love to hear from you. I hate it that it's one way that I can't get back to you right now immediately, but um, take advantage of that little information right there and, and, and let me know you're out there. Uh, again, scholar identity is my thing. Uh, go to it on um, social media. Uh, I'm basically on mainly, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. I don't do much Facebook, but um, uh, link, not LinkedIn. What's the other one? What's Twitter? Twitter. Yeah, Twitter. That's the one. Yeah, Twitter. So yeah, you can find me there if you want, if you actually want to, want to find something about me. All right. So I think that's, um, that's about all I have right now. And um, if you, unless you have any other questions, I think I'm done. Yeah, Dr. Whiting, thank you once again. Thank you for, for being so generous with us and, and sharing your contact information. Uh, we encourage people to get out there and check out, uh, check out all the information that you can find um, uh, in social media online. I know Dr. Whiting has a lot of things out there, all those publications. Thank you once again. My pleasure, and uh, I will hopefully see you all when we get past this craziness and we get back to being um, like we always are. So yeah, check yeah. me out. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. We'll talk at another time. Yeah, great. Good? Yeah, and we want to uh, remind everybody that you can access this recording on www.coloradogifted.org. It'll be there tomorrow as well as all of the conversations with CAG Teeds. It's a wonderful lineup of speakers that we've had there. And also we will not be here for the next two weeks. So everyone enjoy their holidays, have a wonderful break and join us back here in January on January 5th with Judy Galbraith for decades of common and not so common comments and questions from gifted kids. And everybody have a wonderful evening.